Presented by Historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, 
That is why these miraculous powers are at work in them. But others said, He is Elijah. And others said, He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who sent and seized John, and drowned him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him, and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body, and laid it in a tree. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, all Christ. Our faith is confessed in the name of
so that we will not die eternally in our sin, but will rise again in Christ. John preached the same message of repentance and new life to Herod, but Herod did not listen. Herod demonstrates the all-consuming reality of guilt, the accusation of sin. Herod, the committed sin after sin, which ultimately led to martyrdom of St. John. This ultimate sin of Herod began in a relatively subtle way. It began with the violation of the first commandment. Herod did not follow the commandment that says, You shall have no other gods before me, because Herod's God was his reputation. Our text tells us, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod had married his own brother's wife. He sought her out, perhaps in part because she was attractive, but also because marrying her allowed him to climb the political ladder and allowed him to cement a higher standing and reputation among his colleagues. And so, for the sake of looking better in other people's eyes, Herod destroys two marriages. He destroys his own by committing adultery and divorcing his wife. And he destroys his brother's marriage by marrying the brothers. Here, he violated God's word found in Genesis, where our Lord says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be on one flesh. Here is why demonstrates that sin multiplies sin. It began with a lack of fear, love, and trust in God, and his other sins flowed out from his lack of faith. And that is why he asked John the Baptist at the request of his wife. For it was Herod who sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. According to Josephus, when Herod had St. John arrested, he had him arrested on the charge of insurrection. Herod has added a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt not bear his false witness against thy neighbor. The rest of the commandments he has been breaking in our story. And yet, Herod's horrid story doesn't stop there. We learn that he threw a great birthday party for himself and invited several dignitaries and had his own niece dance for them. And being pleased by this dance, and motivated by a desire to save his reputation, he vowed, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. But here, he didn't actually have the authority to make this promise. He made a rash vow and doubled down on it, even though he was not a king and could not do it. He was a governor of two small provinces within the tiny Roman territory of Israel. But he has made his vows in front of these dignitaries that he has invited, and the leading men of Galilee. And now he needs to protect his reputation. Rather than admitting fault and repenting of it, he doubles down to save his standing within that group. And so Herodias' his daughter goes to her, her mother and asks what she should request from Herod. And Herodias sees that she finally has her chance to execute the judgment that she wanted to execute. And so she says to ask for John the Baptist's head and flower. Here it's run through breaking the commandments, culminates in the murder of God's beloved prophet. Here it was greatly distressed because of his vow. He had admired and feared John the Baptist, but here, always true to the political games he played, followed through with his vow. As St. James teaches us, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown brings forth death. Sin kills the sinner. It often leads to the sinner killing others in thought, word, and deed. Sin and the death that it brings becomes all-encompassing. And that is why Herod had heard about a man performing great miracles and preaching. He became convinced that this man was John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Herod must have believed that not even death could stop this holy and righteous man. Herod knew 
This man was a prophet because he had heard him preach regularly. Herod used to go and interact with John, and during these interactions, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him laugh. However, while John was preaching, convicted Herod of sin, he was not drawn to repentance through that preaching. Herod's sin led him to have a heart of heart to reject the word of God. That is what unrepentant sin does. It destroys our ability to listen to God, be convicted of our sins, and cling to Christ. It is not enough to be entertained by the word of God. We must actually listen and follow the word of the Lord and obey His commandments. But before we condemn Herod too much, how often are we also tempted to seek to protect our reputation? even if it means violating God's commandments. Have we ever made rash vows or promises and found ourselves needing to keep a promise or a vow that we should never have made in the first place? Have we ever taken the Lord's name in vain or committed adultery in our hearts? Have we ever allowed unrepentant sin to multiply before our very eyes? That is why John the Baptist been arrested and martyred. John the Baptist had been martyred for the preaching of God's word. He heard about Herod's sin and was willing to take the risk to call Herod to repentance and life of Christ. That had been John's calling from the very beginning. John provides the church with an example who, when we are tempted to not lovingly call our fellow Christians in the world to repentance and life of Christ. Don't be judgmental. I'll live my life, and you live yours. It's a common refrain that many have come to believe. But by John the Baptist, when we willingly and lovingly call those around us to repent, we are being mean or heartless. We are not attempting to elevate ourselves, but we are calling them to find life in Christ, to be liberated from the endless accusation of sin. And we do this even at the expense of our reputation and life. John the Baptist was ultimately, ultimately martyred by Herod and Herodias for preaching the word of God. St. John is one of the many faithful depicted in Revelation where we read, Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Who were to be killed as they themselves had been killed. John the Baptist had washed his robes and made them white in blood of the Lamb. And he even continued to be a martyr that is a witness to life found in Christ even after his death. According to Matthew's account, John's disciples went and gathered John's body and buried him. Then they went and told Jesus what had happened began to follow him. They followed Jesus because they knew who he was because of John's faithful testimony. John had always been pointing to Christ, so that Christ could be magnified in his preaching. And so his disciples knew where to go after John died. But that isn't the only way that John continues to bear witness today. He bears witness whenever we hear his words read at church, when we read them in the scriptures. When we read and hear those words, we hear John the Baptist's faithful testimony that calls us to repentance and to faith and life in Christ, the Lamb of God. St. John continues to testify that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the only one who can save us from the power of sin and guilt. As here it demonstrates, the only way to overcome sin and guilt Guilt is the death. In Herod and Herodias' days, they attempted to silence the accusation of the law by killing their accuser, but that did not work. Herod's guilt did not die. Herod's guilt was not buried along with St. John's. The constant, he rose the dark recesses of his mind to continue to accuse him and to assure that there was no escape. That is because Christ's death is the only thing that can take away our guilt and 
assure us that we will rise again with him, with Herod, with Herodias, but only listened to the preaching of John, they would have been able to escape the power of their sin. But they didn't. They tried to make the accusation go away by killing the messenger. That servant of the Lord that proclaimed Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when he had said this, he meant that Jesus' entire life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension had occurred for the salvation of the world. That all who believe in him and are baptized could be saved and find eternal life. That is why Jesus went through all the villages of Israel, preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons, so that he could carry their sin, guilt, and diseases to the cross. Just as Isaiah prophesied 700 years earlier. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him strict, committed by God and inflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wound we are healed. Jesus' great ministry culminated in his death on the cross, where he nailed and killed our sin. Sin kills the sinner. But Christ our Lord died. Our place. Christ did not stay dead. The grave in hell could not hold him. Rising from the dead, he trampled death by death and showed that he had authority over it. Now, all who have been baptized into Christ have been buried, therefore, with him, or by him, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When those baptismal waters covered you, you were being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Your robes were being made white in this blood. And St. John the Baptist's testimony became true in your life. And from that voice is testimony. In the voice of Christ's faithful apostles, we know that sin is God. Christ is one. And so when the accusing power of sin rises against us to remind us of our many sins, we can confess them before God, repent, and cling to Christ. We can take comfort in the words proclaimed by God's faithful servants. When the servant of God says that he's a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that this is just as valid and certain before God in heaven as if Christ, our dear Lord, declared it to us Himself. Because these words are Christ's words to us. We have been called from a life of sin and death into a life of forgiveness, life of salvation found in Jesus Christ. So we, the John the Baptist, boldly confess that Christ is risen from the dead, and we too will rise with him. <coughs> our guilt and sin are taken away, and our entire spirit, soul, and body will be kept blameless for coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we are both in the righteousness of Christ. Herod was wrought with the guilt of killing John, the man who knew was a prophet, after making a rash up. And that guilt led Herod to believe that John had risen from the dead to accuse him. However, we as Christians know the hope and forgiveness that we find in Christ. We do not have to fear the walks for lie of judgment, nor that our sin and guilt will rise again to condemn us. Jesus nailed our sin to the cross and rose from the dead to give us the blessed assurance that we will rise again. Him. So, with St. John, let us praise Jesus, the one who rescues us from the power of sin and guilt. Amen. Now, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus, the life.